Welcome to Demystifying Science. Today on the show, we have Dr. Jacob Robinson of Rice University, and he's here to talk to us about a new technology called magnetogenetics, which in some ways is the holy grail of neuroscience and is the inheritor of a previous generation of technology called optogenetics. And we're very excited to learn more about it, to find out how it works, and to interrogate the future of the entire field with Dr. Robinson, who is very well-versed in the technologies. So thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you guys for the opportunity to chat with you guys. That was very well-versed is um, generous. I, I know about this stuff. We'll, we'll chat about it. I look forward to it. My first question is, can, how does magnetogenetics work? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Um, so maybe we can start by kind of like uh, defining uh, magnetogenetics okay. Perfect. to some extent. So, um, you know, you mentioned optogenetics, so probably your listeners are familiar with it, but we can kind of just start there, right? So optogenetics is the idea that we can genetically modify a cell so that we can control its electrical activity by shining light on it. And so in that vein magnetogenetics is the concept that maybe we can control a cell uh by turning on a magnet or and when you say control like what if what are typically what processes are typically being controlled like are we making the mice do dances or what what's the well, yeah yeah even with optogenetics can you like sh give us an example of what would what would be a control regime yeah, for sure. So the, the first demonstration of control in optogenetics was to make a neuron fire an action potential. Boom, that's it. Right. So boom, you turn the light on, the neuron fires an action potential. That's a rapid change in the uh, electrical potential across the cell membrane. That's a spike. That's the unit of information that we use in our brain. And it's a particular neuron. It's like you, you wanted to turn this neuron on over here versus all the neurons or something like that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So the idea is that, you know, using a genetic um, approach, we can select which cells are sensitive to that light. So when I turn the light on, it's not every cell, it's only the cells that I've modified that respond to light. And that gives us this exquisite control. And people have really won, run wild with this idea over the last 15 years or so. Got it. But you have to have a light bulb stuck inside of the brain. Yeah. So so probably yes now there are people that you know are trying to think well maybe we could get a little bit of light through the skull and maybe that's enough but in principle yes in almost all demonstrations of my, of optogenetics you need to implant something inside the brain to deliver light so people have tried it out some of these more high energy photons like in the like because uv has some skin depth right yeah yeah, so, so it's actually the opposite. UV no, oh, is terrible. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, All right, correct me. Set me straight. Yeah. yeah, so like UV will burn your skin, right? Right, That's right. What you want. So what you want are the, the low energy photons that have I long see. wavelengths. I see. These are the, the red or the infrared. I see, I see. But aren't, uh, aren't radio waves like, typically bouncing off of things? And, you know, you have... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not an uh, expert in this at all, but yeah, the no, penetration is the problem with, with these, obviously. Absolutely. So the, the, the real challenge with optogenetics that magnetogenetics hopes to overcome, you mentioned the Holy Grail, would be, you know, we, our bodies and our skulls are not transparent to visible light, right? You can't see through me, but a magnetic field can, right? You go on an MRI, you can see deep into the body. And so the idea is that if I could do that same thing that we could do with optogenetics, if I could control spiking of individual brain cells, not using light that doesn't get through the skull but using a magnetic field that does then i might be able to have this external remote control of the cells okay so that's the the, the basics and then what do the cells do that gets into well kind of make a mouse dance or something like that it depends what cells you express and where and how you stimulate them and the the goal is to be able to directly interact with neurons that are somehow dysfunctional or broken and need to be kind of tweaked in order to be to return to normalcy that's what that's one approach yeah but i think you know we, oftentimes in the technology development sector that's kind of where i work um we we consider building the tool because we think that that tool gives us something that we can't do today for example like i said i can't activate those specific cells through the skull right now what you do with it 
that's another question. So one application would be a therapeutic. For example, people with Parkinson's disease, one of the therapies is to stimulate uh, neurons deep inside the brain uh, with an electrode, like it's surgically implanted. And so you might be able to use a magnetogenetic technique in the future to use an external magnetic field targeted to those specific brain cells and never have to go through uh, a surgical implantation, but still receive the benefits of that therapy. Mm-hmm. And how's that and working? Is that working out? Is, is... <laughs> <laughs> no one, no one's there yet. But surprisingly, um, just this last year, there is a, a publication that showed magnetogenetics was successful in producing um, therapeutic deep brain stimulation in mice. How did they gauge that? Uh, a series of behavioral tests. I can't recall them all, but oftentimes what you can do is look at how coordinated a mouse is when you ask it to balance on something or run in a wheel, or you can analyze how it walks. And so there are these methods to um, measure a physiological state like um, uh, associated with Parkinson's disease, which would be a, a discoordination between the arms and or paws, I guess. And then that can be reversed by therapeutic neuromodulation, as we call it, the brain stimulation. How do they get uh, the mice to have Parkinson's? Yeah, great question. So there's, um, <laughs> we're going to do all this. I mean, I have to do this all day. So, well, they don't really know how humans get Parkinson's totally. I, I mean, there's some genetic components and there's yeah, some. Yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. So so what they do is they, they have a mouse model or a rat or a rat model. In my lab, we've, we've often used um, rats to model this. Um, you create a lesion in a part of the brain I see. That, that produces dopamine. And we know that Parkinson's disease is associated with the, um, the, the death of, neuron, of dopamine-producing neurons. In a specific place. In a specific region, yeah, the subthalamic nucleus. Um, and so what we often do in these experiments is we'll lesion um, that region of the brain chemically to kill those neurons. And then what we see is that we see behavioral effects that look like Parkinson's disease mm. in the sense that the animals can't really be coordinated when they try to move. That's mm. interesting. And then we try to restore that. Yeah. So there is, a, is there a genetic model for Parkinson's in mice and rats, or is it solely based off of lesioning? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. We've <laughs> always worked with um, uh, this, this, this lesion model. There was like a there's this, some anecdotes of chemical uh, mediated Parkinson's if I recall correctly too, or like some it's like a this is a long time ago I was my my roommate in college was reading about this but it was like some like some community of drug of recreational drug users got a really bad batch of some drugs and it like burned out this nucleus that you were talking about in the brain and they all came like young people came down with this Parkinson's like disease so. Don't do drugs, kids. Yeah. That's the moral of that story. So with okay, to come back to magnetogenetics, though, and optogenetics. Optogenetics works on the basis that I think that it was Carl Deseroth and his... Ed Boyden as well? Ed Boyden and Feng Zhang, yeah, in his lab. And so they discovered that it was possible to take this light-sensitive bacteria rhodopsin and integrate it using a viral vector into a mammalian cell and then once it's integrated inside the membrane it's possible to shine light on it it opens an ion channel you have depolarization of the membrane you have an action potential the neuron is active what is the process by which you find a suitable protein for magnetogenetics is it also bacterial is it something that's inherently part like the magnetic part of it well yeah because i mean i don't necessarily i know that there's magnetic bacteria and that they orient them, you know, there's the sort of the bacteria that can orient themselves towards a magnetic field. There's various... Like some birds and uh, whales <laughs> Yeah, and <stuff>. like... <laughs> <laughs> magnetic cells, maybe? Yeah, like magnetic orientation, but I've never heard of magnetic control of ion channels. Yes, absolutely. And this has, I think this is actually the question that drew me to the field, you know, you, Carl's lab showed s- such amazing results by finding in green algae this ion channel that was like gated. 
So the question is, could we look to nature and find a magnetically sensitive ion channel and clone that into cells and make cells magnetically sensitive? We can't do that mm. yet. Um, the reason why is we don't understand how any organism other than the magnetotactic bacteria, which is a special case, the homing pigeons, butterflies, um, sea turtles, all these animals that have these incredible navigational capabilities, we don't understand really how they sense magnetic fields. Mm. And, so, and so we don't have the channels. So then um, a group of... And, and it's possible, sorry, just pause you for a second. It's yeah. possible that it's not that the magnetic system is directly innervated like it, there could be a second messenger cell of some sort sort of like in the in the inner ear or something where you have these hair cells that are talking to yeah. the neurons or something so it might not even be an ion channel available in those systems. absolutely yeah it could be a tissue level property we really don't know it's a big open question and i think a fascinating scientific question um but you know as as tool developers we don't have the luxury of going to an animal and pulling out their magnetic sense so are you still digging around in nature trying to yeah, what's going on with the bacteria, for instance? So bacteria are a special case because they synthesize these um, uh, permanent magnets in um, large vesicles. They just oh. kind of like roll around inside the bacterial bodies. Yeah, and they actually line up in a chain. And they're stuck to each other. So they basically act like a compass needle. And so that compass needle twists and turns, and then um, that aligns the bacteria to the Earth's magnetic field, that people are excited about maybe being able to trans um, plant that particular cellular mechanism into a million cells, but it's super hard. I hope someone does it one day, but it is a huge cassette of genes and it's going to be incredibly difficult to translate that to a million system. Mm. Uh, fingers crossed that someone does it, but I can't afford to wait around for that. And so like the appropriate system that would result in transducing that signal to a neuron as well. Yeah, because I mean, like, you have this neat connection between ion channel and how everything already works in order to put, you know, a compass needle inside of Like, you could do it. You could put maybe, you know, you could go to Vetner, uh, Craig Vet, Vet, Vetner, Vetner, who's making the synthetic cells, and you can be like, look, can you put this in? And he does. And then you're, you have a cell that has it, but what does it do, sort of thing? And if you can get it into mammalian cells, that doesn't have the it doesn't seem like it would have the infrastructure to actually be able to to perform any kind of meaningful action and would remain more as a proof of concept than anything so i, I you know i don't know if i completely agree okay you know if if someone were to come to me and say like look order these genes off of that gene transfect your cells and they will make these magnetic particles i bet we could figure out how to use those particles to make a magnetically sensitive cell you know, we tether those things to the cell membrane. Mm. By tugging on the cell membrane, we open up mechanoreceptors. You need them to be created in place. Is that the problem? Like, why can't you just inject the, I mean, there's the blood-brain barrier, but why, why can't you get somehow these nanoparticles in there that would sort of suffuse with the cell and make something that you could pull around? And Yeah. So that's exactly what we have done, you know, we being the engineering community. It's like, we, we can't figure out how to get these cells to make the particles. So we're going to make them ourselves and we're going to inject them into place. So that describes a huge category of magnetogenetics. It's kind of a hybrid synthetic and biological system. So we make nanoparticles that are highly magnetic. We inject them and then we genetically modify the cells. So that that interaction between the injected nanoparticles and our genetically modified cells make them magnetically sensitive. Cool. And you're using so these are mechanoreceptors, like you're saying that you're tugging on the you're tugging on the receptors in order to open them, or how does this work? So that's you know also we can expand on that. So yes, some people are looking at um, magnetic nanoparticles that kind of tuck, uh, sorry, tug on the cell membrane, and that that works. There's work. Um, out of um, Korea showing that, um, you know, ensembles of nanoparticles can twist the membrane and activate them. Similar work from Paulina Anakiva's lab to show these discs that rotate and kind of push on the cell membrane. But that actually wasn't the first demonstration. The first demonstration was that you can heat up the nanoparticles with a magnetic field and that heat activates 
temperature sensitive ion channels or thermoreceptors. Mm. And that turns out to probably be the most efficient and effective way of converting magnetic fields into a signal that the cell can respond to. What are those temperature changes like? Are they like pretty extreme or? Yeah, how sensitive is this? So um, that's an open question. Um, Initially, people were working with thermo uh, receptors that were associated with your kind of noxious heat response. So when you're like, oh, it's really hot, that activates a channel called the TRIP-V1. And that's around 42 degrees Celsius or so. So it's usually a, a couple degrees. So body temperature around 37. So you're heating up maybe five degrees centigrade uh, with these nanoparticles. Work that we have done recently, um, it's on bioarchive and it just got accepted shows that you can take different thermoreceptors we have a lot of thermoreceptors in our body Hmm. things that tell us when it's cold or when it's hot or when the temperature is changing and it turns out actually if you use these receptors that are sensitive to when the temperature is changing you don't have to heat the tissue very much and in fact we've been able to get away with less than one degree c um, just because the heat happens really quickly because we turn on our magnet field this thing starts to heat and that doesn't happen very often in nature. We don't usually experience a rapid change in temperature. And so we're very sensitive to these very rapid changes. And so in that way, we can have a faster response to magnetic fields. Is there much known about how the ion channels are capable of responding to temperature changes? Because that, you know, it, that's outside the... <laughs> You're shaking your head. Okay. All right. No, it's, it's fascinating. And in fact, um, you know, the paper that really inspired us to look into this it was like a 2017 paper out of um, David Julius's lab. And, um, you know, they kind of discovered this rate sensitivity. We don't understand the mechanism of it. We found it in, they found it in, in fruit flies. Um, but it's really fascinating. Um, I think a, a really interesting area for, you know, future scientists. Actually, coincidentally, he ended up winning a Nobel Prize like last year for mm. channels. So mm. it's these same receptors that they're studying. Um, is the key, I think, to a lot of the most successful magnetogenetics. And, and it, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say it's successful because it allows you to couple in this way to something that's so easily sensitive. Because I mean, yeah, um, I was going to ask about the coupling. Is still a little unclear to me. I, I, so from what I was reading, it's basically that the nanoparticles are engineered to be a perfect match to the receptor. Like there's some kind of like binding constant. That, that is ideal between the two of them that's designed? Is that is that accurate? So it, it's complicated. Okay. So We love complicated. The, so what I described is this kind of hybrid approach where let's, let's go to the lab, we'll make some super good magnetic nanoparticles, we'll inject them. There's been another school of thought, which is, can I get the cell to make the nanoparticle itself? Because injecting the nanoparticles is, is really hard and it might not be a great application. Um, I really want a completely genetic system. So once I put my viral vector in, the virus itself will then make the cell magnetically sensitive. And does that make it more spatially specific as well, if you have that ability? Like, like I'm still, can we, so you inject these things right now. They go to, they go everywhere, I assume. And then only... No, they don't go everywhere? How do they really home to, to where your target location? So if we're talking about a, a, a injection in the brain, oftentimes um, the nanoparticles will kind of stay around the site of injection. I see, but you have to like specifically find a place stereotactically and put it there, basically. Exactly. I see, I yep. see. Yep. So that's a little cumbersome long-term with if you're talking about patients or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I could see why yeah, you would want to target exactly. something. Because sp- you can target something quite specifically by using the surface receptors and by being able to say, like, go to this specific group Like with a virus or something? Yeah, I mean, like, I, th- I think that there's pretty specific ability to, to go to an area of the brain or an area of the body based off of receptor penetration. Yeah. Um, you know, we and others have looked into the idea of functionalizing the nanoparticles. So what that does they that bind mean? specifically. Mm. So that means we, we, you know, we put a chemical, um, uh, usually like a ligand or an antibody or something on the surface of the nanoparticle that will grab on to um, a receptor that's presented on the surface of a particular cell type. Maybe it's maybe it's even a gene that we've introduced. These work great in vitro. In vivo, this has just been really challenging mm. um, to get 
really specific binding between a functionalized synthetic particle and your cell. It's it's doable, but it, is that it's tough? Partially, is that because it's the brain and the brain has such tight junctions, or is that just a, this is like a general like? I, are you? Yeah. Do you, do you have insight as to what? I mean, a lot of research doesn't translate between the dish and the and the body. But do you have a sense for why it's so difficult? Does it have something to do with the immune system and the fact that somebody's coming around and and getting in the way? Because I can imagine that I'm stuff sure. just getting coded immediately, right? Exactly. The body's just yeah. like, whoa, <laughs> Hello. right? Yeah, it's yeah, thrown out I by a T cell or something. For sure, I think it, you know the the body's response is a big factor. I think the other factor is that there's so much stuff in the body that whatever it is that you're trying to bind to might also look like things that's all, that are already there. So you end up with all this non-specific binding and then your receptors are no longer you know, available to bind to your target by the time they actually get there because they bound to something else that looks kind of like it. So there's just so much extra stuff. So you just need to build an artificial thymus for maturing these receptor uh, ligand interactions before you put it into the body. No small, <laughs> no small feet. Yeah. So you you get these nanoparticles into the body by injecting them to the specific site. Ideally, you would get them to be produced by the cells themselves. And is that where ferritin comes in? Exactly. So... You know, recognizing that this nanoparticle injection thing is kind of tough, a group of scientists said, okay, well, what cell, what, what nanoparticles can the cells make? And, you know, short of going all the way to magnetotactic bacteria, which no one has been able to translate, they looked at mammalian cells. Okay, well, what are mammalian, what kind of nanoparticles do mammalian cells make? And it turns out that as part of the cell trying to regulate its iron levels, it sequesters iron into these little tiny nanoparticles. And so the thought is, well, let's use these ferritin nanoparticles um, as that kind of magnetic antenna that we can heat up or move or something to activate those ion channels rather than having to inject an external nanoparticle. I'm looking at a crystal structure of ferritin right now, and it seems like the the iron that's stored is pretty occluded. Is that, does that create a difficulty? Because I imagine... Can you describe it for people? Yeah, so basically what it looks like is that there's a bunch of helical protein structures that are clustered together. And at the very center of this globe, there is a cluster of iron. It's a ball. It's a ball. So it's this, yeah, it's it's a protein ball, just like you described. Um, and then inside that ball is a bunch of iron atoms. And it, does the does the protein that surrounds it occlude it from? Does it protect it from being magnetically sensitive? Does is that how does it compare to the nanoparticles that you would manufacture? Yeah, so that's the critical question. It turns out that it that the the phase of the iron that's inside the nanoparticle is such that they're not very magnetically sensitive. Hmm. So the it's because it's kind of the the crystal structure of that that iron is poor for magnetic properties. Mm. They're not sort of like homogeneously oriented or something like that. It's 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 sort of like that. The the actual physics is a little bit more complicated. It's in a um, there's a phase um, where the spins cancel each other out. And it's only on the surface of that particle that you actually have these unpaired spins mm. that give you a very weak magnetic moment. Mm. So most of the yeah. irons aren't contributing to the... Exactly. Spin. Yeah. And in the particles that we make in the lab, we align all their spins so that they're these super paramagnetic uh, nanoparticles, meaning that they have really strong magnetic properties. I can wiggle them with a the magnetic field. But if I don't have, you know, if most of those iron... Uh, atoms are canceling each other out, it's really hard for me to to move them around and that kind of stuff. Interesting. So it seems like the solution might be just shrinking them or something uh, so that they have more skin to... Like it's a sort of classic Galileo's inverse cube law sort of situation where like the surface area you want to maximize and like minimize the volume or something like that. I don't know. I'm just throwing this out. My immediate thought would be to try to like mutate the, the way that the assembly of the nanoparticle or these sort of ferritin works in order to create 
a biological enzyme that's capable of aligning the spins for you. That would be yeah. yeah how do you do that? I was gonna play God. That's what I would do. <laughs> I would I would also do that. Uh, I think it's really hard because you know controlling. You're, you're talking about trying to control the chemistry inside these self-organized biological nanoparticles. That's I mean it's hard. It, it, and and people have played with this. You know, you can do some mutations to those ferritin chains. They're actually, it's a, it's a collection of monomers. I think it's 26 or 27 of these things all self-assemble. And so you can, mm. you can play with them, but then you have to compete against the, fer- the endogenous ferritin. And if you screw it up too much, you screw up the iron metabolism of your cell and it dies. Mm. So, how, yes. How do you make it, those it, super, uh, how do you make them supercharged in the first place or super magnetic or, or super paramagnetic, whatever you call it? Yeah, so super paramagnetic, um, it, it's controlled during the chemical synthesis process. So in the lab, um, you control the temperature and the pressure and the chemical concentrations as you're making these nanoparticles such that all of the uh, atoms align as they self-assemble. Got it, got it. And those conditions are tough to recreate inside of the cell. And so, and this is the sort of the drawbacks of ferritin have been known for a while because I, I came across a paper where there was basically someone who came out and was like, this is impossible, whatever is being reported in the literature off of ferritin. And so was there... Yeah, what, 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 what was their reasoning? Yeah, uh, the reasoning was exactly what Dr. Robinson just said, which is that they're not sufficiently sensitive to an applied magnetic field mm. to be giving the data that was being collected. And so was there some controversy where people were reporting results that didn't seem possible? <laughs> you're not, yeah, you're nodding sure. a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really interesting, I think, from a scientific perspective. Um, you know, we, in, in my lab, we have been thinking about kind of harnessing magnetic fields for these things. And we had actually run some, some calculations on using ferritin because, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's available to us. But if you calculate the amount of heat you could generate from ferritin or the amount of force you can generate using these really crappy magnets, we were like, there's no way this is going to work. This is like three orders of magnitude, six orders of magnitude too low, depending on what kind of effect you're trying to do. You're talking about a thousand times, a million times too weak. So we didn't even try. And then a group of papers came out that said like, look, you can do all this with ferritin. And we were like, what the heck? <laughs> we went back and we, we ran all our calculations again and our, all our calculations were right. So we just didn't get it. And then um, a scientist at Caltech, Marcus Meister, just published a paper. He was like, look, this is all BS. Just do the math. There's no way that there's enough of, um, there's not, not enough heat, there's not enough force to produce the effects that these people are reporting. And then we, we're, we're all stuck trying to figure out what to believe, what's real, and, and, and where to go from here. And has there been a resolution in terms of, because in the paper he proposed that there was some other thing that was happening that was causing the effects that were being observed. Did they retract that paper? Uh, it was a couple of papers. I don't actually know. So as far as I know, those papers have not been retracted. Um, there have been, a, there was a, a series of papers that were published um, in Neuron attempting to reproduce some of the data that was reported and failing. So there was, I think, two or three groups that, that showed that they were unable to observe the effects that were reported in the paper. Mm. We've done some experiments and we have been able to observe some similar effects in our lab. Uh, we published a paper proposing an alternative mechanism. I think since that paper has been published, new work has suggested that that mechanism probably can't explain the results either. Hmm. So where I think it is, is that there's a a set of, um, uh, there's some literature that shows an effect. The effect that was proposed by some of them is probably wrong. It is probably something else that's happening. It could be an error in their setup, but I think that that's unlikely given the number of groups that have observed similar things. And so I think the exciting thing is we can't explain this data yet. So you have an effect, but you don't know what's causing it or it doesn't. Yeah, I see. And so, but, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where we are now. Not everyone agrees with me. Some people think, you know, for example, Marcus Meister, who said this is impossible, I think just believes it's impossible and everyone made a mistake. I tend to be more optimistic and think that the experiments are probably to some extent, 
valid. We just don't understand what's producing the, the phenomenon. And they're using these temperature sensitive ion channels as well with the ferritin? Yeah. Could it be part of the viral? Is it a virus you're using as a vector? Um, yes, I think in, in most of these cases, yes. In our experiments, we did not use a virus. We used a, a plasmid. Mm. So you like made the cells in vitro and then put them into the brain or something like that? So we took a different approach. We were really intrigued by the fact that there was no mechanism that seemed to explain the data. So we, we created a simpler system. So we just cultured the cells. There's no brain. Mm -hmm. There's no immune system. It's just cells in a dish with, um, and, you know, and we played with ferritin levels and we looked at, you know, a variety of conditions, but we basically, uh, oh, and we controlled the temperature. We, we, we did all, we, we, we put it into a more well-controlled system so that we could try to understand the mechanism. That makes sense. And you didn't, but you didn't see anything when you did that. We did. Oh, you did. They just see didn't that. have a mechanism. Yeah. They didn't have a mechanism for it. I guess. Interesting. Yeah. So we're so we're working actively um, to try to understand the mechanism. There's been some proposals in the literature. There's not a consensus as to what can explain it. But I, I I'm in the camp that there is something really happening. We just don't completely understand it yet. Do you have a hunch? Yes. <laughs> Do you want to debut it not in Nature magazine, but on the Demystifying Science? No. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I don't. I don't mind sharing. I, I you know, I'm relatively open about these things. You know, I, you know, speaking with in broad brushstrokes, I, I expect that it's it's likely a mechanical effect, and I think it's probably a weak effect that's amplified by other processes in the cell, and that's why it's been difficult to reproduce, and you don't see it under. Um, under every condition because it's not a direct effect. I think it's a secondary effect of, you know, a weak response that's amplified by other processes in the cell. Hmm. So it's like a complicated story, but I think it'll, like, yeah. So definitely. like some, some part of the cell is getting deformed, which is deforming some other part of it, and it's like this chain of events of some sort. Yeah, probably, I'm, I'm, you know, my hypothesis is that it's calcium mediated, so there's going to be something that happens in the cell. Calcium goes up a little bit. It causes something else to happen. That, that causes secondary calcium, the calcium is yeah. amplified. So it's probably secondary messaging based on a small stimulus. Got it. And is there, is there crossover between electrical and magnetic effects in this kind of a system? Where it's like if you have ion movement and you have something that's weakly magnetic, what's the, what's the link there? Um, so this is complicated. Um, under certain conditions, uh, a magnetic field will create an electric field. In fact, you're probably in all conditions, but in many cases, that electric field is not very strong. In the particular types of experience I'm describing, I don't think that the electric uh, field is enough to explain the observed phenomenon. You really have to crank up the strength of the magnetic field and have a very short impulse. So when you think about things like transcranial magnetic stimulation, which people use to kind of simulate the brain, you're talking about a microsecond pulse. Here, we're, we're applying a magnetic field very slowly over a second. Maybe we're leaving it there. So we're talking about three orders of magnitude difference in terms of how fast we're applying the magnetic field. That makes a big difference mm -hmm. in terms of how much of an electric field you're generating. Uh, do you, would you, could we, could we talk about transcranial magnetic stimulation? Sure. Because yeah. that is, I think, one of the wildest things for me. So I, uh, during the summers, I guide, and I'll have people from all over the place come. And there was this one woman who worked in a transcranial magnetic stimulation boutique. It was the first cool. time that I'd ever heard of it. And she basically was like, yeah, you know, I don't even drink coffee anymore. I just come in and I zap myself in the morning and then I'm just good to go. And I started, at, at first I thought that it was some kind of woo thing where, you know... Yeah there's crystals involved but then I started looking at it and it, it really is possible to control brain states using this external magnetic stimulation there was the nature paper that came out last year which was that they actually managed to treat some woman's depression by implanting a permanent sort of magnetic simulation device inside the brain is this related to magnetogenetics in terms of what it does in terms of, of in how does this relate How to magnetic work? Yeah. yeah. Are you actually yeah. modifying the electric circuits at that point or something like that? 
Yeah, so I would, I, I think it's, it's quite distinct from magnetogenetics in the sense that genetics is an important part of magnetogenetics, meaning that, you know, with magnetogenetics, we're hoping to have control of genetically targeted cells on that cell or that cell or excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons. And I get to pick based on which cells are expressing my genes. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation is not genetically targeted. It's basically, think of it as electrical stimulation, right? If I were to put an electrode on a particular part of the brain, I'm going to excite that part of the brain. I have no genetic specificity, right? I'm just any of the cells that can be activated. And that's kind of what TMS is. You can think of TMS as a way of producing an electrical stimulation through the skull. And it does that because this magnetic field, when I pulse it really rapidly, is going to drive the ions around in my brain, and that's going to look a lot like an electrical stimulus. So it's 100% legit. I, I, I like to use it as a verb, TMS. So I've been TMS. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, Regularly? Back. Were you TMS oh, today? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm missing I out. My coffee. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, so you could do this um, in your motor cortex. So if you if you put your your palm out and you find the motor cortex and you you know zap that part of the brain, your fingers will twitch. Mm. Um, cool. And you will not be able to stop them, even if you try, because you're directly activating the motor cortex. So it's completely involuntary. And so it's a hundred and it's a hundred percent real. Why the fingertips and not like, why not the whole, uh, the whole <laughs> it's a small spot. You got to move it around. And that's actually maybe one of the drawbacks of, of TMS is because you have to have this very strong, very fast field. Mm -hmm. You focus it to a small spot and that's about it. You, yes. you drop all your energy into this tiny area. Is this something you can do at home or do you, is it a, do you need a, do you need a guide for this? Shyla's right. Shyla's starting to write down. He's like, what model do you use? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we do need some well, sponsors. So, you know, I mean the hyper, we've gotten into like the hypervolt lately for like, uh, the for fascia? fascial stuff. Yeah. Especially after workouts and stuff. I think, uh, yeah, if I can get myself one of these TMS things, I'll be one cl step closer to the. Superhuman. <laughs> to utopia. <laughs> well, so what is the what is the long term goal? So if you develop a if you develop a system where you are able to produce, you know, you get through all of these technological problems because obviously the technological problems are an issue. But if the last fifty years of development are any indication, you will get past these technological problems because there has yet to be a technological problem that we tackle that is insurmountable you know we were talking to uh, michael levin from tufts the other day and he's doing incredible things that 20 30 years ago people would have said were impossible and so and they probably have 20 30 more years but it's like, they probably have well, 20 30 more track. years before you're actually regrowing limbs and regrowing you know brains after a traumatic brain injury but there is this there's this vision of what it can do and so in the ideal like world like a clear path forward i guess yeah and in the ideal world what is it that magnetogenetics would offer uh, that's an interesting question i think that in the near term and i'm going to put that in, in air quotes because <laughs> It might be 10, 15 years. Um, I hope not. But in the near term, I think this is going to be a, a, a powerful research tool in the same way that optogenetics has been, right? Optogenetics has been around for, like I said, around 15 years or so. And we're only now beginning to see it uh, being developed in clinical trials in, in human patients. But... For the last 10 years, it has completely revolutionized neuroscience. So our understanding of the brain, because we're able to turn specific brain cells on and off, has advanced dramatically because of these tools. Now, if we could do the same thing that optogenetics did, except now I can do it remotely. I can do it over the entire brain volume. I don't have to focus to, you know, when they shine a light, it's usually a small area of the brain that I'm affecting. I have a magnetic field that could potentially activate the entire volume of the brain with genetic specificity. So I can look at these very large neural circuits and try to understand how they work. So in the near term, I think it will help us reveal how the brain works in the research setting. Can you give us like a really just concrete example of like some process you'd want to understand where you would use either optogenetics or, uh, or, or the magnetogenetics Yeah, like this kind like, of large circuit. Like, what are we... 
Yeah, it's a, it's a. <sighs> we can go back to like Parkinson's, I guess, or something. Like, what is something you'd want to like know about? Yeah, that you would use this tool for. Yeah, I mean, I, this is getting a little bit outside my wheelhouse. I consider myself more of a tech developer than neuroscientist, but let's, right let's just speculate. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Hypothetically, I think I think you know questions of um, you know being able to manipulate brain states. I think would be really interesting. So we know, for example, that, you know, our brain is not an input output machine, right? Like if I'm presented with a stimulus, like I, you know, I, you know, you guys show up on my zoom screen and you say hi, and you know, I'm supposed to say hi back. Right. But what I actually say back to you depends on what I had for breakfast in the morning, whether or not I had my coffee, like what state is my brain mm, in? Like these larger I, patterns, like these sort of, yes. yeah, I see. And so if you could and learn so, those patterns and, and tweak them, then. And then manipulate them and then see, okay, now I put this animal back in that same context, but I've been able to manipulate its brain state. How does that change its social interaction? How does it explain, explain its experience of pain or other types of things? And so I can actually understand how the brain processes information depending on what state it's in, because it can modulate the activity of neurons that are distributed throughout the brain. And how do we prevent something like this from driving towards a future where problems are medicated rather than addressed? Do you know what I mean by that? Where we, yeah. were, we, were, we were speaking with somebody, uh, Muriel Zilikowski, so she's at the University of Utah, I think, and she was working on basically a pill to cure loneliness. I mean, not directly. She's a basic researcher. She's a basic researcher, but she's, she's, she's laying out the pathways, understanding all of the mechanisms in the brain. And on one hand, I can see that it's a phenomenal technology because I think that a lot of people are driven towards things out of a sense of loneliness rather than out of a sense of something that is deeper and broader. And we actually did a really interesting thought experiment where we went and we talked to people on the street if they would take a pill for loneliness. And for the most part, people were like, no. But then they would finish the thought with, if I wasn't lonely, I wouldn't hang out with people. And I just thought that was so crazy because I'm like, how can you be well, basing... Only one, only, only one guy that said that part. No, the, I think that there was, a, there was a couple people. Most people definitely said they wouldn't take it. Though, they wouldn't take it because if they wouldn't have a need for other people. And this came up more than once. Hmm. And I'm sort of, I think that it's not a good thing to, to drive your social interactions on the basis of loneliness. And so on one hand, I'm like, great, if you get rid of loneliness, maybe people will have better relationships, they will develop themselves in different ways, and we will be free of this, this crushing burden. But then on the other hand, it becomes something that you worry about erasing because it's this fundamental state and there is there is an emotional component of being a human and being alive that you have to deal with and it's the burden to carry. And is that a feeling that I have because... So you're like worried about people erasing their uh, bad moods in the morning or something like that with this yeah. technology? And I'm like, does... It, I, I, and maybe this is maybe this is a silly thing to be worried about, but I do worry about that. Are you worried about the misuse of, of this <laughs> technology? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I think maybe I'll, I'll answer this by, by maybe not answering it. Um, <laughs> you, you, you brought up this idea of, you know, thinking about like, what could this be useful for? So maybe I think it would be good to put this into context. So one thing that I, you know, aspire for is that technologies like magnetogenetics, things that we work in the lab and others are working on, will allow us to one day treat conditions of the brain very precisely without having to undergo a surgical intervention, without having to drill a hole in your head, um, you know, and otherwise surgically potentially damage the brain. Now, why do I think that that's important? So you mentioned this article that came out in, in Nature about a pacemaker for the brain, right? These are, there are people, a number of people who have severe depression that are not uh, responsive to the drugs that are available today, SSRIs and these kinds of things. And when you say severe depression, you're not talking about like, you know, my my dog died and I lost my job and like 
there's a reason for you feeling bad. You're like people who are ostensibly having wonderful lives, except they feel horrible all the time for some reason. Yeah, people who are, you know, suicidal tendencies are are not responsive because they're, you know, the everyday occurrence, but it's just they're they're consistently in this depressive state. Um, don't experience happiness. And so we're not. And so um, it turns out that these patients can be treated by stimulating particular parts of the brain. Now, why I think that's exciting is that this is a highly specific treatment. So the alternative, let's say that, you know, these people might respond to drugs. Drugs have a number of side effects, right? You're taking, you're taking a small molecule and it goes everywhere in your body, but you're just trying to treat a particular aspect of your brain. But if I could come in and I could activate just that particular circuit and help restore it to its normal state, we have a way to treat these people in a way that doesn't produce the side effects of drugs and maybe works on pe for people who haven't had drugs. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, the premise. That's a starting point. It's like we have perhaps the opportunity to really help people in a way that doesn't even require them to go through surgery. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like complete, it's so far in the future that it's almost science fiction to imagine it being used for anything else at this point. Like, well, no, in, in but, but, but where I was going to go with this, I think it's a really important starting point because right. I think myself and, and many listeners and probably you and everyone else immediately jumps to like the black mirror episode, right, which is right. like all oh, remote control of my brain. This is how we need to stop this now. Mm. But the reason why I put it, like to put it into context is that there are people alive now who are in these depressive states, suicidal, there's no hope for them. So can we really say, no, we are not going to develop technologies to help you because I'm afraid of the eventual Black Mirror episode? Well, I don't, I don't think that's a totally reasonable like comment so just to like blame the technology. I mean, you know, it's usually like people that kill each other, not like the guns, you know? So I, I'm not sure that like, I think the real question becomes like, how do you, how do you manage the, the technology in such a way that the people who want to kill each other don't have the guns, basically? Like, like there seems to be this real, I haven't looked into this in a while, but I know that when cloning first came out in the 80s, they like, all the scientists got together and were like, they had a symposium. They had a symposium. They, and they were like, the yo, this could it. be bad. Like, let's make some rules up and let's follow them. And I could be like, I, I, I don't know. I haven't been around the academy in like a few years, but it doesn't seem like those kind of conversations are really like happening on that level. Uh, Everyone takes an ethics class. Right. Everybody, everybody takes ethics and there's the sort of, there's the gloss of ethics over it. Yeah. And like, everybody's like, they're like, be good. Will you be good? And you're like, yeah, I'll be good. But there's not like this big, like symposium level, multi-institutional conversation that's happening, at least that I'm aware of. Do you think that science, that technology developers are preoccupied with being morally good with the technologies that they produce? Because I think about Google. But is that even their problem? Well, I think, I, hold on, hold on. I, I, so I think about this sometimes. Google's motto used to be don't be evil. And they took that away. They like erased that at some Obviously. point. Obviously. <laughs> right? They're like, well, you gotta be evil a little bit. I mean, come on, we gotta make money. And they're like, come on, we're not idealists here. We're after something. Yeah. And so the, the Black Mirror episode is, I think, in everybody's minds because you have a technology like this and you're like, okay. Yes, it can really help people and it can save lives and it can do extraordinary things. But what do we do and how do we prevent it from going in that direction? And it seems like the people who are developing it are the ones who have to be in charge of that. Do you think that they do have to be in charge of that? Is there someone else? Is it a responsibility that gets offshored? Where does this, where does this process happen and is it happening? Yeah, so it's a good question. So it, the process is happening. It is very challenging, um, first of all. Um, I've been working with a number of organizations to think about the neuroethics of these technologies. Like, how, how do you prevent it from, you know, being misused? Um, Did you say you're working with a number of companies? Sorry. A number of uh, organizations. Uh, organizations. Oh, 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 like... But, but companies are, are looking into this also. So, um, for example, uh, Facebook just funded some researchers to look into um, neuroethical uh, aspects of brain computer interfaces. Mm. Right? It's a private company, you know, ostensibly evil, who is also realizing that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, it's important to invest also in, in, in ethics. 
Uh, save us money in court later. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. But but this is this is an, an important thing. So what we're trying to understand as as a community are what are the existing incentive structures for the number of stakeholders. And when you talk about neurotech, it's a large group. You have the private companies who are making things. You have the insurers who decide who gets access to what and what they're willing to pay for. You have the technology developers. You have the patients, um, and you have the government uh, agencies. All I think there's a role for everybody in this, and so it's not just the technology developers. It's That's all it. of these groups have to come together, and 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 we are working on, on trying to make that happen. Do you think that there's a void there though at all? Where you know, there's a lot of like you said, there's incentive structures at all of those, and for the most part, those incentive structures are all geared towards growth and technological production. Um, which is not an entirely human objective. Like it, it's sort of like those companies have to produce or else they'll go extinct. I think most corp- most like of the Fortune 500 companies last about 30 years on average. So like they're not really made to live forever. They're just going to keep growing until they die. Um, d- is there a place for like a third party to be involved in sort of advising? And like, what are these organizations you were working with? I guess is, is a better question. Yeah, so so one organization is IEEE. It's the Institute of Electrical Electronics Engineers. Hmm. Um, they're a professional society of technology developers, like myself. Uh, another organization are, are um, uh, private foundations. Yeah. Uh, the Cavalier Institute and the Dana Foundation have been pretty heavy in neuroethics. Uh, in fact, they just started an institute in... Berkeley and at Cambridge, this is the Cavalry um, Foundation. Sorry, institutes about um, technology and society. Mm. And are they? Is that an industrially funded? Uh, no. Yeah, private, um, not for profit foundations. But is it supported mainly by industrial actors, or is do you do you know who they, where they get their money from? Or they they've been endowed um, by. Um, I, I think it was Fred Cavley who endowed the Cavley Foundation, and then um, the Dana Foundation. I think was originally endowed by Dana 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 Farber. I forget the first name, but um, they continue to raise money uh, through charitable donations. My do you, do you think that there's sort of a vision of the world that these organizations are driving towards, or is it kind of a more piecemeal vision of what might happen? Oh, well, that's really interesting. It's like who's dr- who's yeah. steering this thing? I guess, yeah. Yeah. And what are they steering it towards? Mm. I don't think I don't think we a group this large doesn't have you know a central leadership. Sure. There's, there's no doctor doctor who at the top is <laughs> pulling all the strings. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you know, and I think that you know each group has its own vision of the future. Um, I think what I have found in these kind of meetings that I've had across stakeholder groups where there's like entrepreneurs and then there's neuroethicists and there's technology developers and then there's patients. We all get in a room and we talk about the ethics of this. And I think what tends to come out of these meetings is a compromise in terms of our vision, right? So as a technology developer, my incentive structure is actually not the same as an entrepreneur, right? I'm not trying to like make a bunch of money. I just like want to make cool stuff. <laughs> totally. And, you know, and the patient wants to make sure like, you know, their privacy is protected, that they're informed about what's going on, you know, and the entrepreneur like wants to make money, but also kind of wants to change the world. It's kind of a mixed incentive structure. Um, and then we all kind of get together and we kind of compromise and like, okay, yeah, if we do this, then, you know, I get to make cool stuff, but I'm also respecting the privacy of the patients and, you know, the people who might license the technology are going to be able to make money. And so we kind of, you know, um, I guess from a grassroots type of, of collective, try to shape the future. There's no kind of central leadership. In terms of something that is trends, so in terms of, of something, a technology that is put into the body by way of a virus, is there any risk of a non-consensual spread between people if it's released in the environment? Mm. Like if you have if you have mice in a cage, right? Like if you have mice yeah. in a cage and you get is it like an adenovirus vector of some kind that you use? Yeah, they're usually non-recombinant vectors, so they can't reprodu- 
produce and make other viruses. I so whatever see. Gets put in the body, is that's it. And is anybody doing any sort of, because I know that it's possible to have chimeric viruses, where if you have uh, an infection of multiple viruses at the same time, what you end up having is that you end up having these sorts of uh, compatible viruses will produce a secondary form. And is it possible, is anyone looking to see if it's possible if somebody has a bunch, like, you know, they work at a livestock farm and they have a bunch of animal viruses and they have this virus vector that carries this magnetogenetic plasmid, is it possible for there to be any kind of recombination events? Because I think that what people are worried about is they're not worried about the technology being used. They're worried about the technology being used in a way that doesn't respect their consent. And so as soon as you start getting into the world of viruses and you start getting into the world of things that can be transmitted, people start asking the question of, okay, well, so in these controlled conditions, it's okay. But then you have something like GMO crops cross-pollinating across fields, and then people start to freak out because the, mon- the, you know, the Roundup-ready crops are spreading and there's all kinds of intellectual property problems with that. And is if, there like a window for a bad guy to do something bad with this? I guess is what everybody is there wants ever to know. Not that window. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <sighs> and not even okay. So look, I think that there's always a window for somebody to do something exactly. bad. And yeah, what you yeah. want to know is that people are doing the do the 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 very non glamorous due diligence of like, hey, under these conditions, it's very very easy to do bad with it. It's like stress yeah. testing the system. And is someone doing this? Is someone focused yeah. enough on this is the bad outcome and we have to test around it to make sure that it never happens? Yeah, so I think um, the the short answer is yes-ish. Okay. Um, That's more than I expected. The, yeah, you know, you know I, I talk about being involved in, in these organizations. Um, one... I guess misconception that I want to maybe dispel is that nobody's thinking about this. That is actually not true at all. Like well, that's a relief. Pe- the people that work at the company, the people like me who build um, technologies, we all watch the same science fiction shows you guys watch. You know, um, when I try and and talk to my students and people who are interested in neurotech about ethics, they are very interested because we are all concerned about this. We don't want tech, something that we make to be misused. Um, and so I think that there has been a lot of thought and there continues to be a lot of thought about it. Now, we don't have all the answers yet, but we are very aware of the potential problems and are actively organizing around ways to help mitigate them. What do you think is the most effective way to mitigate those problems? As someone who's developing the technologies, do you have sort of a favorite approach? Yeah. Um, I mentioned this kind of multi-pronged ap- approach. I'm going to kind of maybe break it down into to a couple of things. My favorite approach is to understand what motivates each party and to find a way to align their intrinsic motivation along the path of least evil. So for example, if I am a CEO of a big company, I want my share price to go up. So how can we find levers to help the CEO raise his share prices in a way that's going to create responsible ethical neurotechnologies? And I think a misconception is that people want to do bad. No, people, nobody, nobody is out there trying to make like bad neurotech. We end up in trouble when their incentives misalign, right? They're trying to do this one thing and it happens at the expense of something bad. So if you can find a way to say, look, you can still do the thing you want to do. You can still raise your, your, um, you know, your share price. And here's a way that you can do it so that you don't suffer the collateral damage. Mm-hmm. I think that's the right way to go about it. Let's figure out what motivates each party, find a way for them to do it in a way that's ethical. They will be more, more, I found them to be more than happy to accept that. Mm. that yeah, because it's usually the collateral damage that's the problem in technologies, right? It's not usually someone makes a tool that's a big problem. It's like, all yeah, the no one goes out intending to make a bad tool. They're going out and they're just like maybe being fast and loose and sloppy and they don't think about the consequences or maybe they don't care about the consequences. I think it's someone else's uh, problem, usually, probably. Yeah. 
Is there a lot of transparency for people who are worried about the, the the Black Mirror version of this, where they can go and actually watch the discussions happen and maybe take part in them? This is an excellent point. I'm going to make, make some notes. So we're we're thinking about you know how how can we we build these types of um, you know I guess ethically aligned design processes. Um, I would say that we're working on it. Okay. I think that the Cavalry Institutes, that's part of their mandate, is to have conversations between the public and the engineers and the ethicists. I think there needs to be more of it. It's just it's a hard thing to talk about, right? When 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 we first when we first reached out to you, I think that that was something that was that was in the front of your mind where you're like, look, this is this is a conversation that easily gets hysterical. Mm-hmm. And it is not productive to have a hysterical conversation because these are technology. We humans develop technologies. There's not going to be a point where we come to where we're like, look, let's not develop this technology and we'll leave it behind, especially in a world where there's lots of different governments and they're pushing for things. And you have, I think that, what is it? This is what Schmachtenberger calls generator functions, right? Where everyone is being pushed forward because they're like, well, look, if we don't do it, somebody else will. And we should be able to do it because they might be using it in a way that we don't like. And so then if we have our avenue of doing it, then at least we'll have some leverage in the situation. And I think that there's a lot of people that would prefer to see technology stop because there is this view that it has in some ways made lives better, but in other ways made them immeasurably worse. And that's the... That's the crux of the matter. How do you create technologies, especially the kinds of technologies that start to muck about in our brains and start to be able to really change who we are, right? I mean, you talk about treatment-resistant depression, and that is changing who you are for the better, but there's also ways to change people and who they are not for the better. And so... It seems like a wider technological issue, though, because it's unclear that there's any technology that doesn't radically change who you are. Like, you know, just the ability that I'd, like, I like, I actually don't own a dishwasher right now, and I really want one. But, like, <laughs> that would radically change who I am. Like, I would be spending that half hour every evening doing something completely different, right? And so, like, everything's a little bit like that to some extent. And so, I wonder if it's just the science fiction vision has just gripped people more with something like this. I think that you have to get teenagers. Like, face, like Facebook's changed. I yeah. mean, like all these, the internet has radically changed who we are as a species. I mean, all these technologies just completely level things out like never before. I think that getting college level students and maybe high school students to be able to weigh in on this would be valuable because they're the ones that are going to be growing into these technologies. They're the ones that have been raised with Facebook in a way where it's not like Facebook has changed them somewhere through their lives they were born into it and so they already have a sense of what it is and what it isn't and the problems that they see pulling on them and i don't know that there's a lot of forums where people go and collect that kind of insight from people that are going to be most affected by it over the course of their lives because when the society changes so fundamentally like facebook didn't go around asking college students like hey do you want this? It just sort of made something and gave it and engineered it to be so desirable that people don't know how to necessarily control that. And so, yeah, you have, you have quite the, you have quite the challenge on your hands. Yeah. I I do want to comment maybe on a couple of things. So I completely agree. I think education is a huge component and we've, we've been talking about this a lot, you know, thinking about kind of raising and training the types of engineers who are going to ask these questions when they go and work for Facebook, right? Um, and so that's definitely something that's, that's been on our minds. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, we, we, you know there's this, this idea that nothing's being done about it. Um, I would say that, you know, as, as I mentioned before, we are thinking about it and that, um, it, I'll give you an example. I think government has a big, responsibility here, where I think they perhaps failed us to some extent when it came to social media. And I think as technology developers, we all kind of recognize that. We're like, anytime I get in a discussion about, you know, newer technologies, it's like, we don't want to do what social media did, which is just build stuff, realize all of the things that should have been done better, and then go try and fix it. We want to try to anticipate that 
and then build it in as the technologies mature. To that extent, um, there's been a lot of conversations about getting government regulation on this technology early. Mm. Um, Bef- Chile, before they make the top 10 uh, lobbyist group uh, in, in government like exactly. Facebook. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and in fact, Chile ratified into their constitution what they call neural rights. Whoa. Um, meaning, um, you know, they, and they outline what that is. Privacy, consent, autonomy. These are the, the real core issues that a lot of people run up against when they talk about things that go into their brain. And there is efforts to try to protect those as fundamental human rights um, at the government level, which I think would be a big you know, step forward for this. As long as the government can hang out in the country for more than a few years at a time. I think uh, (laughs) Chile is not breaking any records for that lately. No. Uh, Do you, so I guess as a closing question, I have, I have to ask, do you think that there is a common good that people share? And not like, not necessarily that that's not, that's not organized in the right way. Do you think that there's a common good that people agree upon that they orient themselves towards that in appears to be universal in terms of discussing the technologies and in the research programs? Or, or do you get into really these rooms question. and discover that there's just this multipolar problem of how to even define what is good? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't think that there is a universal, this is just my opinion, I don't think there's a universal sense of what is good. I, 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 my sense that I get from, um, cl- I, I, my sense that I get from clinicians tends to be more related to the Hippocratic Oath, which is do no harm. Um, many of the patient advocates also kind of subscribe to that. Like doing good means that whatever we develop doesn't do any harm. Why don't technologists and scientists have to take a Hippocratic oath? I think that I, I think that they should, but but I think what it what it what the outcome is is that our sense. And I'm going to put myself in the scientific, you know, technology developer engineer category. Our sense of good is more, I would guess, risk tolerant. So when you say I do no harm, you're very risk adverse. You're like, well, I don't want to do that because even though it might help me, it could also do harm. I think a lot of the engineers are more um, risk tolerant in the senses. I, I think when I think about good, I, I think about what are the kinds of things that are needed for people? And it's our responsibility to make that happen for them. And of course, I don't want to do harm, but I'm also thinking about those, those patients and the people that really need the technologies. And I'm not going to stop myself because I'm like, well, you know, it could do harm. I, you know, I think this push pull, I think is really important. People, you, you, you want to move forward, but at the same time you have to do so responsibly. And so I think having that push pull, maybe I'm going to talk my way around to the, the solution here. Maybe that's part of the, 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 the process is that there are people saying, okay, let's, let's think about them. Everything that could go wrong. There's also people saying like, but we really still have to help people and move the technology forward. I like that. I mean, I think that that's a huge thing that humans have been dealing with since the first time that somebody was like, you know, we can hit people with rocks, but if we make something out of metal, we can hit them harder. Yeah, and yet and, they're not, you know, and yet we're sitting here in this room not hitting are. each other with rocks <laughs> somehow. <laughs> so it's it's kind of amazing that we that from like all these individual uh goal seeking behaviors we do we do sort of agree that it's best that you know we behave a certain way and we kind of know it without having to talk about it um which is pretty cool so and so hopefully as the technology matures that this will also be the sort of the status quo for whatever is invented yeah yeah and i think that there's you know a recognition you know uh, by all of the stakeholders that you know the, we have a tremendous responsibility to get this right, and so I think we're, we're we're heading into that, recognizing that there's potential. It really touches close to you know home. Like who who are we? You know what, what makes us human? When you start talking about things in the brain, we recognize how how you know sacred that is to people. And so I think the efforts that we're making are 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 everything to do to to respect that fact. Well, that's a relief. That's a really good way to close. I think um, I think these are some some 
questions that need to be revisited from time to time. It'd be interesting to see what happens. Uh, maybe we catch up with you down down the road a bit and hopefully see things are working as we were imagining. Yeah. Do you have any closing thoughts before we before we sign off? Do you do social media or anything? Can people find you out there anywhere? Or? Yeah. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, JT Robinson Lab. Uh, and yeah, and I'm, you know, reach out. Um, you know, I'd be happy to follow up with you guys later. Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you for being here, Dr. Yeah. Robinson. All right. Thanks thank you, coming. guys. Everybody support us on Patreon, and we will see you next time. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you.